Okay, so okay. Sister Robinson, I'm going to mute your line. Feel free to unmute if you have a question, but for right now, we're getting feedback. Okay? Okay. Peace. Okay, go ahead. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome once again to Bethel Talk. We are continuing our Bible study in the book, The Believer's Authority. We are in chapter four, and we have just completed part one up to page 28. And now we're continuing on page 28 of chapter four of the Believer's Authority. And before we begin, we are going to have a word of prayer. Shall we bow our heads? Yes. Father, we just thank you for your word and this opportunity, Father, to speak to others about who you are and about our rights in Christ Jesus. Father, we thank you for the students who have come to hear thy word, Father. And now, Lord, as we place this in our hearts and in our minds, Father, may we exercise by faith the authority which Jesus Christ has given us. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen, amen. and amen. We're going to begin on page 28, and then boys, we're going to ask our sister Cynthia to begin that reading. And then we'll have our first video and discussion, and then we will share the well. Okay. <laughs> All right. This is a, a part of um, chapter four called How to Deal with the Devil. As long as Satan can keep you in unbelief or hold you in the arena of reason, he'll whip you in every battle. But if you'll hold him in the arena of faith and the spirit, You'll whip him in every every time. He won't argue with you about the name of Jesus. He's <laughs> afraid of that name. I have found that the most effective way to pray can be when you demand your rights. That's why I pray, I demand my rights. Peter at the gate beautiful did not pray for the lame man. He demanded that he be healed. In Acts uh, chapter 3, verse 6, you're not demanding of God when you demand your rights. You're demanding of the devil. Jesus made this statement in John 14. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. He's not talking about prayer. The Greek word here is demand, not ask. And with that, we will uh, look at uh, our first video, which is called Praying in Jesus' Name, uh, straight out of context. got this from someone who listens to our church podcast. Can you pray for anything you want, like a job, a car, a house, a husband, a, a billion dollars, and Jesus will give it to you as long as you attach the words in Jesus name at the end of your prayer. It seems like that's what the Bible's saying. John 14 verses 13 and 14, Jesus said, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. People in church use in Jesus' name at the end of their prayers. And unfortunately, many use it like a magic word, like abracadabra, hocus pocus. But that is not what Jesus is saying here. Jesus is not saying, here's how you should conclude your prayers. He's not saying, I'm going to be obligated to do everything you say as long as you attach G in my name at the end. Even if you have a ton of faith, he's going to do it because you said in Jesus' name. No, that's not what this text is about. Jesus does not give us a blank checkbook with every check signed by him so we can cash those checks in every time we pray. And just as long as we put in Jesus' name at the end. Just as long as we complete that transaction with the words in Jesus name, he's going to give us what we say because he says in John 14, 14, he will do it. 
It's not what he's saying. He is the sovereign king over all things. He cannot be manipulated by any of us into getting what we want just by attaching a couple words to an end of a prayer that is not the God of the Bible. So what is Jesus saying? Well, the phrase in Jesus' name, the word name means first representation. It's praying as someone who represents Jesus and what he wants. Second, someone's name refers to their identity, which is why God changed people's names in the Bible. By doing that, God's saying, now that I'm in your life, you are not what you used to be before. You are forever changed. Third, the name of a person refers to their reputation, which is why Proverbs 22.1 speaks of a good name being better than great riches. It's a, it's a person's reputation. This would also mean coming to the Father in prayer, not based on our reputation of sin, but completely based on Jesus' reputation of perfect righteousness. So when you put all of this together, the simplest way I can say it is this. Praying in Jesus' name means approaching God based on Jesus' righteousness, not yours. His goodness, not yours. It means praying in a way that represents him as the God-man, as the King of all kings and Lord of all lords. It's praying as if he was in your situation, praying his will for your situation, praying with his access to the Father. And it's praying for things that would honor his reputation, that will bring him glory. That's what it says in verse 13, right? You pray in his name so that the Father would be glorified. So this is so it's his reputation being enhanced. It's his reputation being seen as wonderful in the answer to the prayers that you were praying. So simply put, how do you pray in Jesus' name? You pray in line with the Bible. You pray what God says in his word back to him. You align your will with his expressed will in his word. That's why 1 John 5.14 says, quote, If you ask anything according to his will, he hears us. When you do that, you're praying in Jesus' name. When you pray according to God's will, you're praying in Jesus' name, even if you don't put in Jesus' name at the end of your prayer. This, by the way, is why people have added in Jesus' name to billions of prayers and did not receive what they asked for. It's not because they didn't have enough faith. It's not because they didn't have the Spirit. Their unanswered prayers are proof they are taking this verse out of context. They didn't really pray in Jesus' name. They didn't really pray in line with his identity and his reputation as a representative of his, asking things according to his will in alignment with his word, as if Jesus was praying in that situation himself and not them. Everyone uses that phrase, right? In the yes. name of Jesus? Yes. I think some clarity. I think this is a place that we probably struggle often mm -hmm. with using, we're called to use in the name of Jesus, but we're called to pray in accordance with his will and his word. But we have to know his personal will sometimes by always listening to his ear. And I just think this is something we need to all grow in. We can't manipulate God, so some things are obvious. We can't say, give me that new car now in the name of Jesus. <laughs> because even though God says you can have these things, that is not per se something literally there that says. Healing, however, mm -hmm. is something that we are called to be healed. He tells us to go out and heal. But we also know that sometimes there are sicknesses unto death. Even in the Bible, they yes. said this sickness is. Yes. So in those cases, it's having an ear to hear what is yes. God's will in this? Or is it the enemy? Or is it something you need to kind of repent of or move in? And so I just think this is a lifelong excursion to understand because it is necessary to say the name of Jesus, but mm. to be comfortable and think you can name it and claim it, mm. snatch it and grab it, or yeah. blab it and grab it, or whatever they say. Yeah. But then on the other hand, right, he's called us to such great authority, and it is a Jesus' authority, so it is in his name mm. that we command these things, demand these things to be. So I know you're going to go into it more, but I just think this is a stumbling block Right? Because mm -hmm. you can pray at a bedside for somebody who's sick and say, in the name of Jesus, that's not manipulation. 
That's what we're called to do. But God may call them home still. And it's not per se a lack of faith. It's just hearing God's will in the matter, knowing that he has the final say. Um, so I don't know. Anyone else? That, that's one of those areas for me, I think, for the carnal or immature Christian, yes. We can't just go around saying, you know, bills be paid, you know, I mean, even that, you know, but rainfall, you know what I mean? Everything yeah. that's contrary to his word and his will in that season. Mm -hmm. We don't do it without having relationship. What is God speaking? Mm -hmm. And then speak along with God in the name of Jesus. In, in some prayers um, that, that I have prayed, I don't know how to stop that. It's okay. Well, just act like it's not happening. Yeah. <laughs> but that's so telling me somebody's good. going in my door or out of my the door at my house. Oh, is that it? That's yes, the brain. Yes, okay. Yes. Uh -huh. um, in praying for a specific outcome, it's always with the understanding that, Lord, you know what we would like, but your will has to be done in this situation. But we could still pray for what we would like. But his will is, is 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 going to be done. But but I find that in those circumstances, it's also good to learn to cultivate an ear because he will speak mm -hmm. his will mm -hmm. to you so yeah. that you're not your heart. Like it says, God will give you the desires of your heart. But it's so that as you grow with him, the desires of your heart are his desires as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. So that you're not constantly praying for something and then. God's just doing something different. You're like, oh, well, God, well, no, he will train you yeah. through it to desire that which he desires. Mm -hmm. Would you call that spiritually happen. discerned and spiritually educated? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no. It's a matter of uh, being able to uh, uh, look at a situation and say, God, I've got a problem here. Uh, you know, Help me, help me to understand how best to approach this. Mm -hmm. Help me to understand what I need to think, do. Maybe I need to change my paradigm. Maybe I need mm -hmm. to change the way I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. God, God can certainly help with that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yes. um, and that's why, personally, I believe God says, covet the gifts. Mm -hmm. So, right now, my prayer is to covet the gift of discernment. It's a very good because I'm coming under greater revelation of what that gift really is. Mm -hmm. We all operate in a level of discernment. Oh, something's not right here. Oh, mm -hmm. just that. But discernment is really understanding the spirit at work. Mm -hmm. And when you understand the spirit at work, that in sickness, you'll understand, you, you get clarity. Is this a spirit of infirmity, right? Is, there, is this a spirit of, of unforgiveness? Because you might think unforgiveness has nothing to do with healing, but it does. It does. Okay. So much so. And so is this something so that so. we need to minister to this mm. person about? Or is it something I need to minister to myself about? Because I'm the one that's sick and I've been praying, heal me, heal me. Mm -hmm. And then God says, it's a spirit of this or spirit of fear, right? Mm -hmm. So that you better understand because sometimes there's a root that undergirds what you're going through that God wants you to get your attention to that thing, mm -hmm. to get rid of that thing. And then all the symptoms associated with that thing just dissolve when you got to the root. But it's only when you begin to be able to discern mm -hmm. that thing. Okay, so it, it is like you're saying what you said, but it's saying it in, in the biblical sense, mm -hmm. right? Because that's what God, what is discern? What is the root of this? What is the spirit in operation? So I know if it's in me, help me work with it, right? Help me cast it out. If it's external, mm -hmm. help me name it and cast it out, mm -hmm. right? Or is this just your will, like the man who was born blind until the appointed time right. so that God can get the glory? Get the glory, yeah. yeah. So you see, my brothers and sisters, the spiritually discerned, the coveting the gifts which God has given you, all these play a role and a part in our spiritual authority. We're going to continue on in this chapter, and we're going to ask, would you like to read the next part for us? Um, let's see, where did we, where did we leave off? We're on page 29, we're on page and we're 29. at the 1, 2, 3. Beginning at the fourth paragraph, which starts on, on the, the other hand. Okay, yes. how far do you want me to go? Let's see. Uh, to the other page. Okay, that goes all the way down to page 30, just above Bates' role in okay. the garden. Okay. 
On the other hand, John 16, 23 to 24 is talking about prayer. And in that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask in my, my ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Hitherto ye have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. The Father is mentioned here in connection with prayer, but he isn't mentioned in the passage from John 14. The Greek actually reads, whatever you demand as your rights and privileges, you've got to learn what your rights are. Many years ago, when I was pastoring a little church in Texas, a woman brought her violently insane sister to the parsonage to be prayed for. Because this woman had tried to kill herself and others, she had been in a padded cell for two years. However, her health had deteriorated and doctors had recommended a furlough at home for her because she was no longer considered dangerous. When her sister introduced me as a preacher, scriptures started to roll out of this woman's mouth. She thought she had committed the unpardonable sin. The Lord told me to stand in front of her and say, Come out, thou unclean devil, in the name of Jesus. Uh, stop right there a minute. Sure. Does anybody know what the unpardonable sin is? Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? That is correct. <laughs> that is correct. <laughs> that is correct. But so many people really don't understand that. That's blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. I'll continue, please. Okay. Um, come out, thou unclean devil, in the name of Jesus. I did that, but nothing happened. She just sat there looking like a statue. I knew I had spoken the word of faith. You don't have to stand there all day long and command devils to come out. <laughs> They're going to do it when you tell them if you know your authority. Mm -hmm. They have to go once the command is given in faith. Two days later, I was told the woman was having a violent attack similar to the kind she had had when she first lost her mind. The news didn't disturb me. In the Bible, we read that when Jesus rebuked the devil in such cases, people would fall and the devil would tear them. I knew the devil was just tearing this woman before he left her for good. I knew she wouldn't have any more spells, and she didn't. The doctors pronounced her normal and mm. sent her home for good. Twenty years later, she was happy and healthy, teaching a Sunday school class and working in a business. Amen. Amen. And so now our next video we're going to see is called Speak the Word. Only. Yes, yeah, Speak the Word Only. Oh. Speak the Word Only. We're going to listen to three it's minutes of this. It's uh, yeah. Yes, it is. Stop that junk. I tell you, God don't believe in junk today. God's words is words that you need to learn to speak. Your whole ministry and your whole life and your whole makeup is formed by words that you speak. You up not being successful. When you speak words, you if you speak the words of God, God begins to work for you. If you speak words of doubt, God does not do anything, never will do anything. He won't even start doing anything, and he'll let you and the devil have it. And you'll wind up not being successful, and you'll wonder why you're not. Many good Christians that live on the earth, they will never be successful to speak of, of anything. They'll never accomplish anything because it's the way they talk and the way they act. They don't talk God talk. They just talk the way they want to talk and they think they have a right to do anything they want to do and, and just talk the way they want to talk. But you don't have that right if you want to receive God's blessings. Now you do have a freedom and a right to do anything you want to do and you can talk the way you want to but you can't, you can't get God working on your side by doing that. If you want to get God working on your side, if you want to find favor in the eyes of God, 
you've got to speak God's words. Now, people that's not Bible readers, they never will amount to anything. Because they'll be too ignorant to ever amount to anything. You say, well, what do you mean won't ever amount to anything? I'm the president of the bank. Well, I'm not talking about earthly possessions. That don't mean anything anyway. You just have to learn that. It's the contact you have with God that means something, not earthly possessions. However, earthly blessings are for you. You can speak those into existence also. You're going to have to learn how to talk. You can't just go around saying your own thing and doing your own thing. All right, now notice the 12th chapter of the book of Matthew. Jesus is talking to us. He starts off in the 34th verse by saying, O generation of vipers, I bet you thought it was going to be real nice. <laughs> How can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. Now let's stop there. Let me go over that just a minute or two to you. Everything that's in your heart will come out your mouth. If I stay around you very long, I can go have lunch with you one day and hold a conversation with you. And I can tell you approximately, I couldn't tell you everything in one day, but I can tell you approximately, uh, you know, what kind of shape you're in. Because if I stay around you very long, your mouth will spit it out. See, it has to, your mouth has to spit it out because Jesus said, out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth will speak. Well, the heart of a man, that's the real you. That's who you are. And when the Bible speaks the heart of a man, he's not talking about the pumping station in your chest. That's not the heart. The heart is right down here on the inside of you where the real you lives. Where you hear this voice of me coming out. See, for those who would like to, speak the word only. Norval Hayes, put it on your paper. Take a chance. Listen to it later when you have the time. Mm -hmm. I highly recommend this video to you. Speaking the word only. Out of the heart, the mouth speaks. What does the scripture say? The word of God have I hid in mine heart. That's right. What does Proverbs 4 say? Thou the issues of the heart, the mm -hmm. mouth speaks. Mm -hmm. So as you can see the word of God and knowing the word and having the word of God in your life, as he said, is a foundation on what you can speak. And with that foundation, you exercise your faith and exercising that faith gives you authority that God has given you to claim your rights in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us continue on in chapter four as we Bev, would you like to read for us Faith's role and authority. Yes. Role and yes. authority. yes. <clears throat> Faith is involved in exercising spiritual authority. Yes, there are times when evil spirits come out immediately. When they don't, when you speak the word of faith, don't get disturbed about it. I base my faith on what the word says. Some people's faith is not based on the Bible. However, it's based on a manifestation. They operate outside faith in the sense realm. If they get certain manifestations, they think the devil's gone. But he isn't gone just because you get a manifestation. He's still there. And you need to know that and exercise your authority. When circumstances don't change immediately, some people become discouraged and slip back into the natural. They start talking unbelief and they defeat themselves. Mm -hmm. They give the devil dominion over them. Okay, let's stop right there a minute. Talking about speaking defeat. How do you think that happens to, to the Christian when, when, when they go from, from one side of faith over to the other side of unbelief? Is it because they expect to see a manifestation of their faith? And since they don't see it, then they speak unbelief? Mm -hmm. Or they may have prayed for a, a circumstance or a situation 
you know, over and over, and they don't see the result that they desire. Mm. So then that might lead to unbelief. How does it happen in your life, how fast you go from praying for one thing and speaking something else? <laughs> mm -hmm. How about one of the ones that happens all the time is yes. we're praying for healing. Mm. The doctor gives a report. Somebody says, how are they doing? It doesn't look good. The doctor said, uh -huh. mm -hmm. that's speaking contrary to what mm -hmm. God is able to do. Mm -hmm. It's also speaking the fact of what you literally just experienced, mm -hmm. but it's contrary to what God is able to do. Mm -hmm. And so you're shooting, like I always say, shooting a basket on the enemy's team, saying it doesn't look good when nothing looks good but God. But God. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we need to I go back to the Shulamite woman and say, it is well, or I believe God, there you go. or I'm I trust. standing in faith. Yes. Yes. I'm trusting the I'm Lord. I'm holding on to his hand. That's how it is right now. He's I don't have to go tell ahead. you all the behind the scenes details mm. of what they are saying. Right. Whatever they say, God is able. Yeah. But what do I say? Yeah. Yes. Same I thing say. with finances. These are the two areas I find that we all kind of oftentimes talk a lot against. You know, you believe in God to, to, to pay this. Right? Mm -hmm. So how's it going? Doesn't look good. <laughs> you know, they just cut my pay at the job. I'm not getting overtime. You know, my mm -hmm. pension's been you. Whatever it is that we see in the natural, we're saying. Mm -hmm. But that's contrary to the belief that God is able to supply all of my needs. Mm -hmm. So we have to train ourselves to say, God is working behind the scenes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I don't know yet. God is working. I'm waiting on God. Mm -hmm. But those aren't our default things that come out of our mouths. And and what he was saying is clear. We, we stand on faith, but we are speaking something else, and our mouths have power. Yes. yes. Think about how we speak about our kids. Mm -hmm. You know, we love them. I don't know what they're going to do. They're just doing this and that, you know. Mm -hmm. When we should be speaking, it is well. They're thriving. Even if they're not, they're thriving because my faith sees it in the future. Mm -hmm. of what God has said for them. Mm -hmm. So that's why I said, what do y'all say? Because, you know, we have to put it in personal terms and realize that we are the ones ourselves, as much as we love the Lord, that participate in these things that nullify or paralyze or, 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 or be stabilized, yes. right? Because God operates by faith alone. Mm -hmm. And he mm -hmm. does know our hearts, but he needs us to come into agreement and be participatory in it. Mm -hmm. By standing on the word, which also means the things that come out of our mouth. Mm -hmm. And that's my big thing lately. We're not so aware of it because we're talking a lot. It's just how we are. We're, it's just life. Mm -hmm. You know, we're talking, but we have to watch what we say. Yes. Because it contradicts what we believe. Okay. Yes, we go for it. I'm not moved by what I see. I'm not moved by what I feel. I'm moved only by what I believe. Stand your ground. Amen. Amen. Stand your ground. What you believe. So now we're going to see a video. Yep. And this one's called how to pray in faith with authority. The next day when they came by, they saw it. And Peter, calling to remember and saith unto him, Master, behold the fig tree which you cursed is withered away. You know, we don't have the benefit of hearing the way he said this, hearing the inflection of his voice. But I can guarantee you, he didn't just go... Master, the fig tree which you cursed is withered away. It was more like he was shocked, like, Master, the fig tree that you cursed, it's dead, it's withered away. He was shocked. And we don't have the benefit of hearing the inflection of Jesus' voice either. But when he, Jesus answered and said, have faith in God, I don't believe it was like, have faith in God. It was, it was like, have faith in God. What's wrong with you guys? I've been with you for years and you still don't get it. He was shocked with them. And then he said this unto him. He says, for verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, 
but shall believe those things which he saith, he, which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. There are four times that the word say or saith is used in there. And three of them, he says, whosoever will say unto this mountain, and I don't believe he's talking about or limiting it specifically to a physical mountain. He's just talking about to whatever your problem is. Whatever your problem is, speak to it. Whosoever will say to this problem, be thou removed, be thou cast into the shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he say will come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he said. So there's a number of things. You have to speak to your problem. Most Christians talk to God about their problem. God, I've got this problem. God, this bill is due. God, would you do something? That's not what he told you to do. He told you to talk to your problem. Speak to your problem. Imply it in there. If you sit down and really think about this, for you not to talk to God about your problem, but to just talk to your problem implies that you understand you have authority over things, that things will obey you. So this is implying that instead of asking God, speaking to God like, God, I'm nothing, I have nothing, but I know that you could solve this problem. Would you fix it? That's not faith. When you talk to your problem, it means that you understand that God has already done his part. Jesus has died and given us the authority. And for you to just speak to your problem instead of speaking to God about your problem implies that you are taking your authority and making this work. So you speak to the mountain and don't doubt in your heart, but believe that what you say comes to pass. You will have whatsoever you say. That what you say comes to pass. You will have whatsoever you say. Amen. Brother Womack was giving you the word right there. You could write that down on the inside of your Bible. That's right. Yes, uh, Cynthia, you want to continue? Okay. Okay, continuing in chapter four. Before I received the baptism in the Holy Spirit, I was a young Baptist pastor. This was during the Depression, and I had a mother and a little brother to help support. My mother's small income paid the utilities, taxes, and insurance. My income bought our food. I owned only one suit and uh, an extra pair of pants. During those depression days, much stealing went on and someone stole both pairs of my pants. They were stolen on a Monday and I was to preach that Thursday. So I prayed Tuesday as I left my job, mm. Lord, all I've got is a pair of khakis and I can't preach in them. They're old work pants. I told the Lord that by Thursday, I expected to see my stolen pants hanging right where they had been. I prayed that the person who had stolen them would be so miserable that he would have to bring them back. You see, it's a wrong spirit that makes someone steal. I was dealing with uh, that spirit and not the person. Because we have authority over spirits, I commanded the spirit to stop this action. When I came home on Thursday afternoon, I knew those pants would be there, and they were. So we can and should rise up against the devil. All right. So. I have two reactions to that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because my one reaction is, so preach in your old pants. Uh -huh. You know, I mean, there's a certain amount of, to, to that, you know. What stops you from preaching the word of God? Because you just have a pair of old pants? And so that's one reaction. And the other reaction is, is basically what he says here, you know, praying in faith and, and so on, that the, the pants and taking the authority mm -hmm. um, that, that God wants you to have those pants and they'll be there. Mm -hmm. um, so, like I say, I kind of have a twofold reaction to that. Um, yeah, I agree with you, but I, I am assuming also the time period that whenever he wrote, or whatever his cultural context was, yes. that it was going to be a grave taboo for him to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and not that he couldn't, mm -hmm. but that it would have been a disrespect in his cultural context. 
And if God was not calling him to make that statement, right? Because, and I think at the end of the day, he would have preached him whatever he had if he didn't mm -hmm. first say, you know what? This is uncomfortable. This is not going to go over well. This is not acceptable. Give me my pants back. Because realistically, something was stolen from him. Mm -hmm. So so I hear you very well, but different cultural contexts, and not only cu cultural contexts, but different upbringings that demand certain things and that's all I, I'm gonna leave it. I'm gonna leave it there. Uh, I would think at the end of the day, instead of not preaching, he would have preached in the mm -hmm. I would assume, I would hope. Uh, <laughs> but also it is, you know, and the enemy will take things from you to, to get you off your game, to try to uh, uh, invoke fear or inferiority or, or shame in us. And so whatever he needed to be battling at that time, that's another thing to me about listening to the spirit. Sometimes these things happen because it's a battle within us that needs to be defeated, the battle of being less than. And so, yes, go out there, out you are, you're calm. Or he was dealing with authority at that time. Um, and so now it's a battle of my authority. T take your hands off my stuff. We have to kind of know where, where we are at that point. That's all I can say about that. <laughs> I share this story also in terms of... Um, I had, I shared it several times, but you two might be the first time you get to hear it, so yay, <laughs> where I had uh, foster kids in my home, and my, there was one night, all of a sudden, the $20 I had in my bed was on, and my engagement ring was gone, and so I knew who did it, um, had a conversation with them, first of all, I found my $20 in the toilet, which means they tried to flush it when they oh. busted, mm -hmm. so I assumed my wedding ring might have also gone down, had a conversation, talked to them, Stone face, no. Okay, next day was church, and I knew for me that even though I was like, you got a lot of nerve. I had, you know, I love you anyway. We don't battle against flesh and blood. Okay, okay, you, you know, I still love you no matter what. Be nice to be honest. Okay, still stone face went to church and they were singing that Hezekiah Walker song that said, um, I'm reaping the the prom, I'm reaping the blessings God promised me. Take back what the devil stole from me, and I rejoice today. Yes. I shall recover it all. Mm -hmm. So I'm not concerned about something that has sent, has value, monetary value and sentimental value for me. I'm going to praise God. But when I sang that song, I didn't sing it to her. I sang it to the enemy. Mm -hmm. Take back. When I went home that afternoon, my engagement was not back where it was. It was on the dish rack. But it was somewhere where I could easily find it. Mm -hmm. Okay? So... So this resonates with me in terms of you stole something of mine. Yes, I can go on. Yes, I can get another. But devil, it did not belong to you. What you took from me, I demand back in my authority. So I don't know what that does for you, but just sharing the story of sometimes. I don't keep... know, but they said once the devil stole it from you and he used it and that... ran around with it, yeah. we don't want it no more. We don't want it. <laughs> Bless you, oh Lord, indeed. <laughs> oh, no. okay. That's sure. what one preacher told me. He won't let that go. <laughs> he won't let that go. And I'm like, that could be, but also, <laughs> did not deserve it. You had no authority to take it. Mm -hmm. And I demand what's mine back. Okay? Yeah. Um, and so even with that, I think he understood. You did this. You have no authority. You have no right. Give it back. It's also showing us our power of the enemy. Because we often will go and say, well, I lost that. Well, I did this. And we let a lot of things go. And when you know sometimes it's the enemy messing with you in whatever way it is, you know, mm -hmm. you don't go and choke the person up. <laughs> <laughs> but you tell the enemy, I know it was you. I know what you're trying to do. It will not work. Mm -hmm. I demand it back restitution yes. something yes because you had no legal right to touch anything that belongs to me well i thank you pastor i thank you students if you come to that time oh, well, we so have to say goodbye oh, but wow. we're coming back next week chapter five of the believer's authority and we're getting to the heart of the matter yes exercising your authority exercising your authority. We're going to take a look at chapter five on how to exercise your authority and boldly claim in the name of Jesus your rights. We ask one more time that you come and return to us next week. We will open up the word and the book and we will teach once again on the believer's authority. I thank you. We are going to close in a word of prayer. Sister Cynthia, can you close us in a word of prayer? And we will begin service short. Father, we thank you and acknowledge you in this place at this very moment. 
We thank you, Father, for the revelation in your word. And we ask 